All right, I think this is a good time to begin. Again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for this conversation. Um, I, will begin by, I will begin by introducing this event and um, IFF and our guest today and myself as well. So hello everyone, welcome to Digi, that, that Digi Yatra is what we call this event. Digi Yatra is what we call this event, which is a little attempt, attempt at decoding the Digi Yatra service and what it means for past passenger privacy. Um, my name is Disha. I am an associate counsel at the Internet Freedom Foundation. And and part of my work includes looking at surveillance, surveillance technologies, uh, especially those deployed by, deployed by state and uh, state functionaries. As part of this, we look we look at uh, you know we at IFF have been looking critically at the Digiatra service from the lens of data protection and the surveillance concerns insofar as they relate to the use of facial recognition technology. This intervention is not new for IFF. For several years now, we've been critically examining the privacy policy and the data ecosystem of Digiatra. Uh, we've done the ecosystem of Digiatra. Uh, we've then done several, several blog posts on it. And uh, now we've taken a slightly different route and we've come out with a Know Your Rights leaflet for all passengers who have been aggrieved in the last few months on you know, the coercive deployment of Digiadra without their own consent and autonomy uh, that's been playing out at Indian airports. And they also launched some exciting merchandise um, in relation to basically that helps you say no to Digiadra without really saying that helps you say no to Digiadra without really saying those words, those words. So today this event is again just a very recollection of what we know. And also we're bringing in some fresh perspective in the form of our guest, uh, Jagrati Chandra, who, is, uh, Jagrati Chandra, who I will just introduce in a minute, a minute. And we hope to get some insights in the aviation industry and how, you know, Digi Yatra is really deployed at the deployed at the ground and, and what we as passengers need to be aware of and informed about in relation to our rights. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Jagrati. Uh, Jagrati, Chandra is, Jagrati Chandra is a journalist who has focused on aviation policy for over 10 years now. She seeks to put people at the heart of her writing, including passengers and the aviation workforce. Aviation workforce. She is presently uh, with the Hindu and uh, Jagrati has been proactive reporting on Digi Yatra, especially these few months. And like IFF, she has also and like IFF, she has also put out explainers, really, really breaking down what the Digi Yatra service is. Um, Jagrati and IFF have that in common, right? We rely on each other's work quite extensively. And this and this event only feels like a very natural conclusion uh, uh, to that partnership. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Jagrati. Thanks, Disha. Thanks for that introduction. Awesome. Um, so this conversation, just to briefly briefly give everyone a structure, we'll seek to first really understand what Digiatra is, how it's been implemented, um, the roles that various stakeholders play. Um, the roles that various stakeholders play from the airlines to the airports to us passengers and the Digiadra Foundation, how passenger centric all of this really is. And ultimately, we need to critically analyze its data ecosystem, data ecosystem for, it, for its privacy and surveillance concerns. And we will also discuss the efficacy and lawfulness of the facial recognition technology, which, which is at the heart of Digiadra. Digiadra. We will be opening up the floor for questions, questions twice in this one hour. So please feel free to come in when that, when that happens. And, and me and Jagati will both try to answer your queries to the best of our um, knowledge. So let's jump in. I would be happy to, I would be happy to give a brief history of Digiatra from, from a, a policy perspective first. And then I will call Jagrati to really add on to how this is implemented at the airport level and what roles different stakeholders play in this. So to simply put it, Digiatra is a biometric based airport service and um, sort of a flight boarding system, which is based on the premise that once you have registered ahead of the travel and you scan your face once at the entry point of the airport, you can breeze through airport processes without showing your identification or your boarding pass processes without showing your identification or your boarding pass again. At the moment, it is being deployed at 14 domestic airports in India. It was first introduced to make, first introduced to make airport port processes quicker um, but right after the COVID-19 restrictions lifted, it was sort of repackaged to be this contactless and seamless boarding option that would also relieve, relieve um, post-pandemic congestion, airport, congestion at airports. Traditionally, pass passengers were expected to load the Digiatra app and register before their travel by linking with their Aadhaar card or driver's license. Today, that requirement has really gone out of the window um, with what airports are calling one-time signups. And these sort of one-time signups with Jagrati will also have some more one-time signups with Jagrati will also have some more insight into. These can happen on the spot, say at the entry gate of the terminals for the passengers by barely by merely showing um, any of their ID cards and getting their faces scanned, moved on from an app to a walk-in service of sorts. And recent news reports and surveys will tell you that you know passengers often don't even realize that they're signing up for Digiatra. 
to really speak from a policy perspective its origin story um, comes from its origin story um, comes from from back in june 2017 um when ministry of civil aviation launched digi yatra as an as an industry initiative um and it followed the life cycle of any policy development there were stakeholder and public consultations there were interministerial committees set up to really discuss digi yatra and facial recognition and that sort of seamless voting option except unlike the legislation it was always posed as a state facilitated service which is voluntary and you can choose to avail it it can, it was never mandatory choose to avail it it can, it was never mandatory it's never never been mandatory but now if you look at digi yatra things have really changed there's pretty strong undercurrents of um a being a privatized service it doesn't even look like a policy or a state initiative and b it doesn't feel voluntary anymore it has you know pretty aggressively been deployed as a as a compulsory or a mandatory option and sometimes people don't even realize that they're signing up for it um in 2018 the ministry of civil aviation envisioned handing over the operations and the development and management of the digi yatra data ecosystem to a private company which is the digi yatra foundation and that is a joint venture between five which is the digi yatra foundation and that is a joint venture between five private airports which is delhi mumbai hyderabad bangalore and cochin so today as it stands digi yatra is run by a private company but was always conceived as a state initiative now jagruti i would be very interested in hearing from you um you know how is digi yatra really implemented at airports what is one time sign up what are these e gates for what is the infrastructure and process yeah so uh digira is essentially a mobile app and it requires uh, a passenger who's booked a ticket to you know before you depart for, uh, for your uh, journey um to download the app and to depart for, uh, for your your uh, journey um to download the app and to register on it you provide your name mobile number email address and the aadhar document to register you also upload a selfie so that your photo is reconciled with the, your photo on aadhar with the, your photo on, on aadhar uh, so these two steps lead to the creation of a digi yatra travel id and uh, when you upload your tickets your um, travel details get updated in your digi yatra id um after that once you arrive at the airport you can just uh, you know come to the e gate you scan um using your phone which has your boarding pass you scan your boarding pass at the e you look into the camera that captures your photo and uh, once the face verification is successful the e gate will open and you will pass through so what this essentially does is that it uh, it it uh, creates a token that you can use uh, for the rest of the journey this token is essentially nr on on your ticket and your face scan um so um the benefit is that uh, once you arrive at the next check in point you do not have to present your boarding pass again you can simply just do a face scan and pass through um um but uh, you know, what happened in december was um you know there was a meeting in the ministry of civil aviation and the minister emphasized that there was a need to uh, ramp up enrollments and uh, that's when we saw that um, civil aviation and the minister emphasized that there was a need to uh, ramp up enrollments and uh, that's when we saw that um, you know at several airports um, there were uh, private airport uh, staff deployed to ensure day of travel enrollments so if you were a passenger who had not downloaded the app and registered on digi yatra um you know um uh, the, the private airport staff would walk up to you would just ask you whether you have your boarding pass and whether they could use that boarding pass and um, or you could ask any questions you know they would sign you up for it and and that's when we started to see a lot of complaints um you know emerge on twitter there were uproar um uh, what what would also happen if you had not if if you are not been stopped by these um, uh, private airport staff in queues what would happen is that if you arrive uh, at the gate where the cisf personnel uh, check uh, your id documents uh, they would just ask you to look um, into a screen and you did not know what was going on you were not asked or you were not informed um and and, um, and people you know unknowingly would do that um and what was this this was the day of enrollment they at the bottom of the screen uh, there was a message written whether you consent to be enrolled for the giatra or not but the thing is and i have experienced it myself um there, there is no time um to look at the screen um the letters were not legible they were not big enough for you to read and uh, so because you're in a hurry and you just want to enter the passenger building you would just um you know scan your face and uh, immediately the screen would be turned around by either the cisf personnel or the private staff and they would fill in consent on your part um so this uh, the manner in which this was being uh, done was uh, was what 
basically the screen would be turned around by either the CISF personnel or the private staff and they would fill in consent on your part. Um, so this, uh, the manner in which this was being uh, done was, uh, was what passengers uh, for the story that I worked on um, and, and they spoke about the, uh, the deceptive manner and the coarse manner in which this was uh, being done. This was uh, being done. Thanks for that insight, Jagati. I feel like you and I have both experienced this on a personal level. I think many of our listeners have also experienced this. We had thousands, I mean, not if not thousands, then at least several hundreds of reports on, you know, uh, Twitter of people coming out and saying that they were made to or forced to look into a camera and they were denied that they would not be able to board their flights if they didn't. Um, so this concerns me in the sense that um, it's a free service, right? And now it's been rolled out in almost a mandatory and a coercive fashion. I wonder why, I mean, what's in it for the different stakeholders? I mean, you have reported extensively on the aviation industry from a passenger rights first perspective. I would like to hear from you if really passenger convenience and passenger seamlessness is at the heart of what is in it for the ministry, what is in it for the airports and what is in it for the airlines if they are on board with the Jiyatra, why so? Yeah, Desha, thanks for that question. It's a very good question. Um, yes, at the heart of this um, entire policy is seamlessness, uh, you know, to ensure paperless travel so that um, um, passengers can quote unquote zip through, you know, uh, various checkpoints, you enter the gate, uh, you pass through security and you arrive at the boarding gate. Um, uh, so um, this is how it's been promoted by the government, seamless, you enter the gate, uh, you, you pass through security and you arrive at the boarding gate. Um, uh, so um, this is how it's been promoted by the government. Seamlessness is the promise that uh, has been made. Um, and uh, and um, another terminology that is used by the government is to improve passenger throughput at airports. So basically allowing airports to process more number of passengers in a short time. And when this policy was launched by uh, then Minister for Civil Aviation, Suresh Prabhu, it was also said that, you know, instead of building bigger and bigger airports, we also need to use technology uh, better in order to, uh, you know, improve capacity utilization at uh, these airports. So that was the promise. Um, but um, the critique of this would be that, um, you know, uh, ensuring seamlessness or in ensuring that a passenger, um, say, uh, enters the passenger building gate and reaches the boarding gate, say, between 10, 12 minutes. This is these, this, this is the time duration that Minister MOS Jayant Sinha then spoke about. Uh, it can't be just through use of technology, you know. It will then also require one to look at airport design, you know, um, airport architecture. And is that then happening, right? Um, um, I know that this is a concern right now. And the Bureau of Civil Aviation Security is examining this. It's pushing uh, airports uh, to remove retail outlets so that passengers do not have to walk in a circuitous manner to reach their gate. You know, your phone is examining this. It's pushing uh, airports uh, to remove retail outlets so that passengers do not have to walk in a circuitous manner to reach their gate. You know, you're forced to walk through duty-free, you're forced uh, to pass through retail outlets before you can reach the boarding gate. And while right now this is being done from a security standpoint, they want to ensure a smoother evacuation, you know, and that passengers should have sort of this linear passage from boarding gate to exit gate. Um, um, it, it has been a challenge. BCAS is pushing through uh, various airports, um, uh, but it is, it, it's a challenge. And, uh, and uh, I don't think the government is very focused right now. I don't think that sort of push has come from uh, the ministry for something like this. Uh, this is what I hear from airport sources. So, um, um, so you can't just look at uh, improving seamlessness just through technology. What about other ways? If, if seamlessness was the promise, you know, and the other uh, factor is um, same um, accessibility for differently able passengers. Um, that's been a major issue, say, availability of wheelchairs and other um, accessibility for differently able passengers. Um, that's been a major issue, say, issue, say, availability of wheelchairs and other infrastructure. So um, are we looking at seamlessness in, in a um, 360 degree uh, manner uh, is my question. That's an excellent point um, that I think you've made. Also, something that, you know, we were discussing earlier and I've also read your work on is that suddenly there's been a boom in e-gates and infrastructural sort of, um, you know, machines been put in airport, airports to just push Digi Yatra forward. 
who's paying for this? I mean, center, right? Those are the questions that we're asking. Um, I'm sure like the Digital Foundation is made up of shareholding from different private efforts. So there is a direct, um, you know, push there, but it's also calling itself a non-profit organization. So um, um, it's very, um, I think, full of opacity and full of vagueness in terms of who really is behind it? What's their interest? Um, there is a little bit of suspicion, as like a lot of civil society tends to have sometimes with policy, um, you know, policy inputs that are quite intrusive. So those are questions that you know come to our, our minds. Do you have anything to say on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, when the policy was unveiled in Rajiv Gandhi Bhavan, uh, Minister Prabhu uh, made this uh, comment. He said that any service provider involved in facilitating, I'm quoting him, any service provider involved in facilitating travel of passenger from door to door will be able to use this platform in future through innovative solutions. So um, um, the incentive that is being offered to airports, for instance, is that you use, um, you know, to sort of promote various retail outlets that you have at airports, um, all of those benefits. Uh, are, um, um, and additionally, passengers are being told that, um, you know, to sort of, sort of promote various retail outlets that you have at airports, um, all of those benefits. Uh, are, um, um, and additionally, passengers are being told that they will be able to have sort of updates on their, you know, if there's a flight delay, or also in the policy, it mentions that um, you will be able to have sort of this digital, um, you know, tool that will help you navigate the airport. So if you don't know where um, is, say, immigration, you can just um, check it on your mobile app. Uh, but um, uh, the critique is that this is not happening at the moment right now. Uh, the critique is, is that this is not happening at the moment. Right now, all that the Digi Yatra app gives you is this QR code that is your boarding pass. You're not getting, um, like a, like my colleague Arindeep was pointing out, you, you don't even get to know whether, you, uh, you know, what's your boarding gate or what's your terminal uh, for your flight. Um, uh, but uh, yes, we will see in the days to come that airports will use this app uh, for various uh, sort of, um, you know, other business activities. We already know that Adani, which uh, who owns, um, you know, as many as six airports in the country has already announced an app um, it's called the Adani One app and so the idea will be that um, you know a large number of passengers that pass through five of its six of its airports uh, will be on this platform now further Adani has um, you know stake in Flipkart and Flipkart also owns another travel booking portal called ClearTrip um, so and there are talks going on right now between ClearTrip and Adani um, you know, um, to how to promote this app and what sort of um, products to sell on it. Um, so uh, we are going to see um, airports trying to milk this app um, as much as possible. Well, that is... <laughs> um, airports trying to, to milk this app um, as much as possible. Well, that is, <laughs> that's surely something. I do, you know, I, I mean, I was made to, uh, as part of my research, I felt the need to download the DigiAga app and test it for, to my, for myself without really giving away any personal information. And I saw on their landing page that they're now launching a cab service, they're launching booking of hotels and uh, some retail experience. Again, the word seamlessness comes to the fore. So there is definitely plans for scaling. Um, I have also seen from presentations made by the Digital Foundation officials um, that there is a plan for scaling up. So it's not just going to be limited at airports. If, if you know, even at airports, it's not going to be limited to only boating processes, but retail, cab service, booking of hotels, yeah, limited to only boating processes, but retail, cab service, booking of hotels, yeah, this is uh, sounding like a, like it's not going to stop anytime soon. But I do want to ask, you know, when we're talking about the airport ecosystem, um, I think Digi Yatra became a thing um, after, you know, COVID restrictions opened up and, the, and airports came in full swing. They were full of passengers. And I remember reading a press release that to decongest airports, they are going to, you know, now install Digi Yatra lanes for faster boating experience anyway. Uh, but COVID also brings something else to fore. And we've, you know, briefly spoken about this before, is that there is a pattern of soft nudging when it comes to airports and security personnel in downloading certain apps. We saw this with Arugya Situ as well. And uh, the way it was, you know, we never, as passengers, didn't really know if it was mandatory or not. I mean, on paper, it said voluntary. And when you reached there, they said, where is the app on your phone? There is a lot of confusion among passengers as to what is voluntary, what is mandatory. And we're in such a rush all the time that we just need to board our flight. We don't want to sit there and argue with any of the personnel. It's a very high risk and high, like, you know, time crunch situation. 
So do you have anything to say about patterns that you've been seeing in the, uh, in the airport um, environment about nudges and these voluntary mandatory sort of structures? Uh, well, yeah. Um, so you're right. Um, so uh, in uh, on, on May 25th, 2020, when um, you know domestic travel was uh, reopened, domestic flights were reopened after a two-month-long uh, lockdown. Um, um, there was a detailed um, sort of SOP. Uh, there was a press conference that was held. Was uh, reopened. Domestic flights were reopened after after a two-month-long uh, lockdown. Um, um, there was a detailed um, sort of SOP. Uh, there was a press conference that was held about about the manner in which domestic air travel will take place and there was a detailed sop to be for was a detailed sop to be followed by airports uh, airlines and passengers and uh, and um, this included you know downloading the aroge setu app and uh, and i remember uh, we wrote about this um, that uh, there it was quite ambiguous within those SOPs whether ROQ C2 itself was compulsory or not compulsory. So, um, you know, a web check-in was made uh, compulsory. Uh, sorry, a web check-in was encouraged. And if you were web checking in, you had to uh, use the ROQ C2 app. Uh, but if you, were, if you were arriving at the airport, um, then you could produce your COVID-19 certificate, etc. So, um, but... But the fact that just for web check-in, it was being made mandatory, the airlines ended up announcing to their passengers on their, um, you know, uh, websites that um, that they must download Aruge Setu app. And if you spoke to airlines, uh, you know, about why this was being done, they said, look, if, if you have the app, it's just going to be far more seamless for you. Um, and that's the benefit. So uh, the vagueness within the, um, you know, guidelines, the SOPs translated into actually uh, it being made mandatory. But I will say that during COVID-19, it actually helped the aviation industry, you know, um, it being made mandatory. But I will say that during COVID-19, it actually helped the aviation industry, you know, um, so to a large extent, you know, they um, there, there was a, there was a need to maintain social distancing, and um, and, and even though uh, the policy had come out, the policy for Dijiyatra had come out a few years before COVID nineteen. All all this, the digitization itself, you know, hastened because of COVID nineteen, and uh, airlines saw the benefit of that, um, and therefore, once the once COVID nineteen was over, it was airlines which had been you know slightly reluctant after all this was their passenger data that they would now have to part with and share with airports um they were open to sort of you know implementing it of course there was a lot of push from the government involved um for both airlines and airports but that was the experience um we spoke um, you know um, um you, you spoke about nudging passengers yes again uh, with aruge setu app when we asked, um, you know, officials whether it was mandatory or it was not mandatory, they would say that we are we are nudging. That, that's the exact word that an official used. We are nudging passengers to adopt uh, Aruge Seto. Um, so what that nudge actually turns into a shove, a push, um, and um, and again, uh, same similar complaints from passengers about the manner in which this is this is the direction in which I think aviation air, air travel is headed globally. You know, there there will be digital digitization of travel it's um, this technology is being rolled out across different airports um, uh, but what we have encountered here is this trust deficit uh, digitization of travel it's um, this technology is being rolled out across different airports um, uh, but what we have encountered here is this trust deficit which needs to be sort of filled right now you're right when you talk about the trust deficit, right? Because nudge, uh, it becomes a shove and it becomes almost, um, you know, being held by the neck and being forced to look into a camera and get your face scanned. And I mean, I, like I said, many of our listeners would also have experienced this. And, you know, in a minute after this one short question that I have for Jagati, we will open the floor to hear from the listeners as well if they've in experiences themselves at domestic airports. But my question is this now, Jagati, I will also supplement this uh, by, you know, my own experience is that a lot of us have encountered this troublesome um, deployment, right, and felt sort of robbed of our dignity at the airport. And we haven't found the space to argue with the personnel because A, we're going to miss our flight and B, there are people behind us standing in the queue, which really don't care for this. They just want to hurry up through the process and board their own flight. We're going to, you know, we're under a lot of pressure in that sort of a moment. 
Now, one very important part of any democratic um, infrastructure is a grievance redressal system, right? And um, I think when I encountered this in late December, my first inclination was to complain about it somewhere. Like there has to be some mechanism through which I can uh, reach out to the airport staff or like the airport authority and state my concerns that have been, you know, undignifiedly pushed into this um, this really intrusive service. Now, there are two ways of doing this. I found that um, the Dejiyatra Foundation has my concerns that have been, you know, undignifiedly pushed into this um, this really intrusive service. Now, there are two ways of doing this. I found that um, the Dejiyatra Foundation has a an email ID written in their privacy policy, which as IFF as well, and personally as well, I have written to them noting some of the concerns. And second is the Air Seva portal, which is a very generic and general route of making complaints against anything you encountered inside an airport. And I found there in the Air Seva service, there is absolutely no drop down option for Dejiyatra related complaints. And it's restricted to a thousand character limit complaint anyway. So you can't go in any sort of detail about what happened to you. So I want to hear from you and from a perspective of being in an airport. How do you like what's what's your experience in airports being a passenger centric environment? Do they really respond to complaints? Is a complaint addressal even a viable option for passengers like us who've been aggrieved uh, by Dijiatra? Uh, well, I mean that is the core of pro the you know wh whatever problems that of uh, that air travelers face right now, um, and the core of pro the you know wh whatever pro problems that of uh, that air travelers face right now, um, and while the government has decided to sort of focus on seamlessness uh, through Digi Yatra, there are much bigger problems um, as well, such as the issue with delays and cancellations and refunds. Um, and where do passengers take these complaints? Um, yes, there is Air Seva, but we filed an RTI um, about two months back or so. And in the entire year in 2023, they had reached, uh, received only about 10,000 complaints, which I don't think is a fair uh, you know, measure of um, the actual kind of problems that people have. Um, so... Um, uh, we also know that um, uh, recently last year, so um, uh, we also know that um, uh, recently last year there was an attempt by the Ministry of Consumer, uh, Consumer Affairs um, to sort of um, you know pull up um, airlines and um, get cracking on them about various complaints um, that were made on the Consumer Affairs portal. Um, but Mocha stepped in and said, hello, this is our domain. What are you doing? You're infringing. You're encroaching on our uh, jurisdiction. So um, this has been um, um, a sort of a big po policy gap um, that uh, various bureaucrats acknowledge that um, that remains to be addressed. There, there is no, what's the term for it? Um, an ombudsman. There is no ombudsman uh, for people to go to. You know, initially the uh, DGCA itself had sort of a helpline, but they are overworked. Really, are overworked. Um, and um, yeah, Air Seva isn't that sort of very transparent, very interactive. Um, it's more of a you know they collect data and then they sort of try to coordinate with airlines to get some problems um, addressed. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, um, and. Um, Broadly speaking, yes, as far as aviation policy is, is concerned, this whole passenger lens is missing. Um, and uh, and that is also very evident in the way the Giatra has been implemented. The fact that a privacy is seen as some sort of, you know, like something fancy that people are talking about. The very fact that um, the, the airport staff, the staff hired, they, they were sort of... Uh, more focused on gathering uh, more people to enroll for people are talking about the very, very fact that um, the, the airport staff that staff hired they they were sort of uh, more focused on gathering uh, more people to enroll for rather than sort of informing them and collecting their consent and you know being sensitive towards that um, but uh, i mean i think the dj yatra foundation also realizes that these are like sort of teething problems and um, whatever concerns we have taken to them, they have sort of attempted to address some of those. So I, I, I was told and I was sure that they did sort of later after a report came out, uh, put up, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, boards at, at, the, at the gates informing people that, you know, uh, this is the Digi Yatra counter and, um, and, and you know, um, you're being registered for it for one time enrollment. So um, I won't say, I mean, that it really goes a long way in reassuring uh, travelers and whether the staff um, have been sensitized or um, I don't think that has yet been done, um, but they've been open to feedback. 
Right, that's good to hear. I mean, very recently, I remember reading your work and some other journalists as well who reported on Sindhya and um, Karat Bhavi saying that they will be implementing changes. Uh, remains to be seen how that happens because there is now, like you said, a trust deficit that needs to be filled before any of these, um, you know, changes are made. And that's always a concern that you know, right now, because there's such an outrage about Dijatra and non-consensual deployment, that now they're going to be acting on it and remedying it. But you know, in the near future, they might resort to their old ways. So you really like that, that trust, like you said, needs to be filled. Um, with that, I think uh, we've reached the middle point of this conversation, by which I mean, in the first half, we really looked at the infrastructure and the deployment, and as well as the coercive uh, means through which being onboarded onto Digiatra. And the second half, we will address um, the facial recognition technologies behind it, the surveillance and privacy concerns. But I will take this moment to stop for a bit and um, ask our listeners and the deployment and as well as the coercive uh, means through which being onboarded onto Digiatra. And the second half, we will address um, the facial recognition technologies behind it, the surveillance and privacy concerns. But I will take this moment to stop for a bit and um, ask our listeners if they want to share any experience that they had in a domestic airport with relation to Digiatra or any other questions that they may have for Jagdhi and myself. Um, please feel free to send a request to unmute and please do ask your question. I will open the floor for two minutes. Hey, good evening. Uh, this is Vendita Satish Guttala. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh... Hey, good evening. Uh, uh, this is Vendita Satish Guttala. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, session. Uh, I've been I've been uh, Chief Information Security Officer and uh, Data Privacy uh, Expert, and I have many certifications in there. So one thing what uh, uh, what uh, I uh, took from this thing is. Uh, lack of consent from the passengers, like uh, whenever they are passing through the gates, uh, they are not informed what uh, they, why their face is being scanned and why they are being uh, uh, enrolled for this thing. So in privacy, consent is uh, enrolled for this thing. So in privacy, privacy, consent is a must. So there should be a broad consent which where the users must be explained in their in their local language what this is being used for and why it is used, being used for. So. If the passengers are coerced in uh, in uh, taking this uh, service without uh, giving the consent, then I think it's a very very big issue uh, that needs to be resolved uh, by the people who are working behind this thing. And uh, also, uh, since uh, uh, this uh, service uh, is fast tracking the persons to get into this, uh, is fast tracking the persons to get into the airport. So I I I've used this DJ Atta many times, and it, it was a breeze for me. So there are dedicated lines for me to check in. Uh, there are dedicated lines for me to get inside the airport, and I uh, and I uh, saved a lot of time in doing this thing. So uh, the thing is that the concern must be there. People should be made understand why they are doing that thing. That is one. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, I don't think there is nothing called as a loss of dignity when they are being uh, taken over here. Okay, so we have been to uh, other countries. I have been to US and others where we have given all our biometrics and everything. Even uh, last year when I was uh, traveling from. Uh, New York, uh, the gates were uh, used by uh, a facial recognition. I wasn't aware that uh, they were given. They, were, they didn't give me, uh, con uh, ask me for my concern. Okay, so I was uh, really surprised that uh, they have not asked my concern. But still, uh, it, it helped me, it helped them to uh, board uh, passengers very fast, quickly, and uh, the flight was on time. So uh, uh, I don't think there's any issue in the uh, dignity, but yes, uh, the way, the manner it was, in which it was being uh, pushed into should be looked into. And uh, they should uh, also, as you're telling a uh, grievance here, uh, they should uh, look into that thing. Uh, thank you. Look into, and uh, they should uh, also, as you're telling a uh, grievance here, uh, they should uh, look into that thing. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Venkat. That was very insightful. Um, I think I'll take a stab at answering that in two parts, and then Jagruti can, of course, come in. I think the first part of it is consent, um, of course. 
Um, any processing of data, of personal data, in this case, Digiatra uses your facial biometric data, as well as your personal details and your ID card, as well as your travel details. These are all private uh, information and personally identifiable information. And, you know, international standards tell us that you need identifiable information. And, you know, international standards tell us that you need to take consent before, pro before processing any such data. I wouldn't say Indian law because the current uh, Digital Personal Data Protection Act has not been operationalized yet. It's not been enacted. Um, so, yeah, uh, law, policy, and just legal ethical principles of data protection tell us that you absolutely need informed and verifiable consent of passengers to before you process their data. Right? So, yeah, in process their data. Right. So, yeah, in the, the manner of, of deployment in India and in the other states that you unfortunately also faced, um, absolutely unlawful and incorrect. Uh, privacy is connected with dignity under the um, under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. And we have a very clear articulation of, of this uh, through our courts as well, right, that it is your dignity. So when we say it's in undignified that, you know, you are just presumed to be somebody who will not understand the repercussions of what is happening with you. And you are just made to coerce or like made to sign up on onto a service that you, they assume that you don't understand, they assume you won't fight against it. That is undignified, right? So that is definitely kind of why we uh, so aggressively attacked um, the manner of deployment of the GR. All of us did. As passengers, we attacked it. As civil society and journalists, we attacked it. The second part of it is the actual convenience of it. Um, I will say that there is a lot of problems with the Digiatra system in itself. It relies on technology like the facial recognition technology, which is, I will come to it in the second half, is inherently flawed and biased and very, and can be easily used or misused for arbitrary purposes. And because always remember that this is a state-backed initiative and a government initiative, so they're used or misused for arbitrary purposes. And because always remember that this is a state-backed initiative and a government initiative, so there are surveillance, surveillance and privacy risks associated with the face um, that is being scanned, right? And your personal information that you're giving. We at IFF always make it an endeavor. At IFF, always make it an endeavor to empower and give information to our community and to everybody on how this can harm you. But at the end of the day, if you do want to go for Digiatra, despite and you know knowing all these facts, and you you think that it is it is convenient and it is helpful for you, then that's your prerogative, and that's absolutely a choice you are free to make. So we definitely not um, make. So we definitely not um, you know. When we have these conversations, we are not barring anybody or we're not saying, oh, absolutely, you know, you, you must, uh, this might, will be a bad decision if you go for Dejiatra. No, we're arming you with information and we're, as civil society, our job is to fight against the policy uh, and not against the people who are opting for the policy. So that is continuing to be our objective with this as well. Um, Jagati, if you have anything to add to this. No, I mean, I think Winkert brings a very relevant perspective, and this is something that we hear uh, very often from frequent travelers, from corporate travelers, uh, very often from frequent travelers, from corporate tra travelers, um, that Digi Yatra does help them um, um, save time while traveling. Um, the question really that, you know, uh, the, the Shah has posed is uh, the manner in which the, this has been rolled out. Um, uh, a lot of passengers have also said that uh, while the Jiyatra is voluntary in nature, uh, at many airports it almost seems as if that voluntary element is being snatched because, um, say, four out of five will have the Jiyatra uh, and only one gate will be non the Jiyatra. So, um, and then you have to deal with long queues at that only that one gate that is for you um, um, and therefore they feel again that the choice is a uh, factor is being snatched away so uh, but uh, there are benefits um, and um, and uh, yes perhaps these are problems perhaps uh, some of these def uh, trust deficit issues will be addressed but um, yeah that's all I mean th there are many people who have said that they've benefited from the DR. will be addressed but um, yeah that's all I mean th there are many people who have said that they've benefited from the Jiyatra. Thank you for that, Jagati. Um, in the interest of time, we will now move on with our discussion and we'll open the floor to questions once again towards the tail end of our conversation. So if anyone else has questions and they weren't able to ask it, uh, please do hold your breath and we'll we'll be right back with that. Um, so right now, I just want to you know quickly pivot to uh, the really the meat and bones of what we at IFF do, which is to really critically examine such policy interventions from a lens of privacy and talk about surveillance, right? Um, the big elephant in the room when it comes to Digiatra is that inherently this is a service that is based on facial recognition. And in um, when you when you look at facial recognition and what it means from a tech and a human rights perspective, there are lots of worries um, that come to the fore. I will begin uh, in, a, in a very brief and interesting way an articulation of FRD um, is that 
see FRD is all around us, right? In our uh, our face locks on an iPhone, for instance, um, is that is that see FRD is all around us, right? In our uh, our face locks on an iPhone, for instance, and this is a question we've gotten a lot on our Instagram posts as well that um, we FRD is everywhere. Everyone has our facial data, uh, this and that. That's not exactly a great thing. Why? Because our facial data is one of our most prominent identifiers, um, right? From a crowd, you will be able to be identified by anyone, by any official, by any government, by any private um, entity as well, from a crowd. And that is a very unique point that no other data point has. No other personal data um, sets you apart like your facial data does. So it's a very sensitive um, sort of data, which we call um, biometric data. And it's accorded a sensitive and vulnerable status all around the world. Um, even you know previous iterations of our data protection laws had a separate category for sensitive personal data and the IT rules and the SPDI rules, which you know, of course, accorded a special level of protection to sensitive person, sensitive personal data, and the, and the IT rules and the SPDI rules, which you know, of course, accorded a special level of protection to sensitive personal data. Now, Digiatra uses facial recognition technology to scan our facial, sensitive facial data, store it for however long. Um, you know, the other foundation has clarified that it purges it after 24 hours or whatever it is, and it shares that data with um, third parties. This is that data with um, third parties. This is an articulation from their uh, privacy policy is that the digital uh, digital other foundation shares that um, your personal data with third parties for many purposes of um, targeted advertisement, marketing, promotions, etc. This is all happening in a complete regulatory vacuum. When we say that, we mean that there is no law that regulates or that um, puts limits on the use of uh, facial recognition technologies in India. I mean, if we really take a step back and look at the landscape of things, we don't even have it. I mean, if we really take a step back and look at the landscape of things, we don't even have a data protection law, which is active, right? The Digital Personal Data Protection Act, that it's kind of in a limbo because unless the data protection rules are notified, a lot of these uh, provisions of the Data Protection Act will not come into, uh, come into action. So what is happening is that Digiatra as a service, which is a state backed and a government backed service, is collecting personal information in the absence of legal safeguards and the absence of checks, balances and limitations that are put into how this sensitive data is used. And that is a big part of our concern is that not only with Digiatra, but facial recognition in India generally. You have CCTV cameras when you have um, these authentication systems for collecting ration or marking your attendance in government offices. All of this is happening in a complete regulatory vacuum. And you know that when there are no checks on how you can use a certain data or a certain database, we don't have enough trust in our government that no, they're going to use it for good, good purposes only. That's correct, explicitly. So a big point that we make about FRT, that FRT is inherently, um, you know, it creates room for misuse. Another added um, thing to this is that facial point that we make about FRT, that FRT is inherently, um, you know, it creates room for misuse. Another added um, thing to this is that facial recognition technology is also very inaccurate, um, right? They say that you're going to be, as a passenger, be identified by your facial metrics and your facial data points when you sign up for Digiatra. But facial recognition in India, the way that it's used, has inaccuracy rates of up to 20%, which is a very high margin, um, right? And we know from RTS that we at IFF have filed with the Delhi police, um, and the Delhi police has told us that it has an inaccuracy rate very recently um, of 20%. If criminal use of FRT, which is a very high benchmark of usage, has such high inaccuracy rates, you can imagine how um, you know how inaccurate um, FRT might just end up being for Digiatra. You know, in, um, you know how, how inaccurate um, FRT might just end up being for Digiatra. You know, inaccuracy is not even one of the big concerns, but it does creep in when you talk security. Um, if you're saying that you know many people use the um, use the argument that Digiatra and by recording your faces, there's also security angle to it. That tomorrow, if you're identified to be a miscreant or a criminal, um, you know, that sort of information might benefit the airports. It might not. We have very high rates of inaccuracy benefit the airports. It might not. We have very high rates of, ina of inaccuracy in a criminal identification in India. So that's one reason as well. And at the end, end um, we always like, you know, human rights activists and civil society always wants to convey that facial recognition in India or even world over has been used so much as a tool to discriminate on the basis of appearance and to target in, in, in terms of profiling and surveillance, right? This is not something we're making up, but you've seen that very recently in the farmers' protest, there were drones used, there was systems of um, facial recognition and identification used based on the, which they um, identified certain people and canceled their passports, or they gave notices that their lands will be seized, 
right? So you're not only using um, the same technology for a good use or like a very harmless use, um, which is maybe digiatra, you know, it's easy to say that it's harmless, but the same form of technology is also enabling a targeted sort of attack on certain people. And um, there are many, many divides within the Indian society, be it class divide, caste divide, religious divides. And this sort of an identification technology might be used to target, I'm using the word might in the future, be used to target, profile and surveil um, people who exist within the margins or within intersectionalities. And this is a concern very unique to the fact that Digi Yatra is a state backed and a government backed service. We see private entities using FRT, you know, left, right and center. But um, when the government uses it, there is a state backed and a government backed service. We see private entities using FRT, you know, left, right and center. But um, when the government uses it, there is a concern for how they're going to use this facial, um, you know, facial data points, how they're going to use this information. Will they going to be using it against us? One more element that comes into the fore is transparency. We don't know a lot about Digiatra. We don't know much about the Digiatra digital ecosystem and the data ecosystem. We don't know how secure the database is. We don't know how frequently they do audits of their cybersecurity or of their, you know, entire ecosystem. This is security or of their, you know, entire ecosystem. This is because of two reasons. One, that the Digi Atra Foundation, which takes care of all of this, is a private company, right? And we can't really ask them for this information because they're not a government body and we can't really file an RTI, we can't really demand accountability from a private company like that. And that's very convenient because previously it was the Ministry of Civil Aviation, but they really like roped in a private company and it's getting everything done through that channel. Second is um, that they do have an auditing authority, which is the Computer Emergency Response Team, CERT in, and that team is part of the Ministry of Electronics of India. That is in, and that team is, is part of the Ministry of Electronics of India. That is a public authority. But in December itself, CERT in was excluded or exempted from the ambit of the RTI Act. So you can't even really ask CERT in about the cybersecurity audits that it is conducted on Digi Yatra. So at this stage, as citizens, as passengers, as civil society, as journalists, we have an extent of like, we have so much um, opacity and we have such limited view and limited transparency into what really is going on, right? We don't know what the data flow is. We don't know who these third parties are that Digi Yatra Foundation is sharing our information with and uh, what kind of information it's storing the foundation is sharing our information with and uh, what kind of information it's storing the, and sharing at the first place. So these are some concerns. Uh, with relation to FRT, with relation to transparency that really, you know, make us worry. Jagrati, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, so Tisha, I would only like to say that uh, this is a new technology and uh, it will again have new security challenges, um, um, you know, and uh, for instance, uh, in February, there were two incidents um, uh, in Mumbai where uh, you know, ticketless, a ticketless traveler was able to enter the uh, passenger building and then reach right up to the boarding gate. And in one instance, uh, the passenger was also able to board the plane, reach right up to the boarding gate. And in one instance, uh, the passenger was also able to board the plane. And this happened despite, uh, you know, Digi Yatra being deployed. And, um, and uh, th this was because of tailgating. So because um, a ticketless traveler was able to, walkless traveler was able to, walk closely behind another passenger. Um, he was able to enter first the E-gate at the terminal building and then the security checkpoint and then uh, up to the boarding gate. Uh, so, and now, uh, you know, um, various airports have, uh, have been that they have to ensure that there is no tailgating. And um, uh, even the uh, E-gate um, OEMs have been asked that they must improve their technology to ensure that two people are not able to pass through an E-gate at the same time. Um, uh, so while you talk about challenges of FRT, I am I'm talking about, um, you know, security challenges that, again, a new technology will pose and, um, and uh, you know, um, and these will have to be then addressed because I was speaking to an official in charge of security at airports um, who's saying that, you know, again, Indian airports um, pose their own kinds of unique problems, the kind of crowding that you're bound to see here. And Indian airports... Um, pose their own kinds of unique problems, the kind of crowding that you're, you're bound to see here, here and the large groups that often people travel in um, and therefore the way they sort of enter through these gates. Um, so these um, are, are the challenges. Uh, well, I mean, there, there is no foolproof. 
you know solution but um this will have there will have to be a work around thanks for that insight jagdeep you absolutely did not know that was a thing and that certainly does not relieve any of us um at this point i would like to open the floor for questions again i see that there are some requests um at least three people want to ask questions so please um if i can request ashlesh to let them um unmute themselves one by one and we'll take questions hi anurath um what's your question for us hi uh so uh, good session uh, as always so my question with my question i absolutely do not want to dampen your spirit and the kind of work you're doing uh but this is something i feel i are we fighting a losing battle in the sense that we have seen similar systems put into place uh at multiple avenues uh, be it uh, in the form of aadhar or be it in the form of this dg i've seen similar systems put into place uh at multiple avenues uh, be it uh, in the form of aadhar or be it in the form of this dg yatra thing um so and being a computer engineer and seeing how systems fail and the kind of bugs that can creep in and how much energy of my personal energy goes into keeping systems up and running um i do feel that there would be bugs which which can cause havoc uh, so coming bringing all of that together are we fighting a losing battle and uh, how do you keep your spirits up when, when it's your job to just dive into uh, these are just dive into uh, uh, these murky waters and continue your job thank you loaded question thanks for that anurath um i take a stab at it first and then i'll invite jagdeep to add if she wants to um you're right it is quite cynical because there's no stop to how much you know there is to respond to it just keeps happening but i will say that every battle um which is worth fighting is worth fighting hard and um, you know with digi yatra we see that it's it's quite um, inspiring to see that there was an outrage on twitter about the uh, non consensual deployment and jagdeep reported on it some other um, you know folks from the industry reported on it and within a couple of days we had responses from the digi yatra foundation ceo and from um, mr sindhya who really just you know try to remedy the situation and try to uh, they made who really just you know try to remedy the situation and try to uh, they made official state, official statements about remedying it so because all of us mobilized and came together to really raise our voice on about how uncool this is and how intrusive this is um we were able to draw attention from the people at the helm of all of this and hopefully we will be changed uh, seeing some changes in in terms of how this is deployed at the first place so it's it was a very low hanging fruit for so it's it was a very low low hanging fruit for us to first attack the manner of deployment and i know like listening to this space tomorrow they're not going to withdraw dg yatra that's not how it works but as a civil society and as people who are aware of our privacy and our rights Uh, we can definitely make noise and i'm confident in saying that uh, you know it is noticed and it is heard it may or not always be responded to in the way that we want it to but it is heard <laughs> jagati anything you want to add yes no i just want to say the same thing i mean um um as as uh, uh, reporters who write on policies you know and um, you sometimes get the opportunity to flag concerns either through your writings or in your interactions um and yes um um things or in your interactions um and yes um um they, they are noted noted and um, the i mean the government does sort of at least take the reports seriously and we saw a sort of a response from both DGYF as well as the ministry um to the concerns that were voiced that's all i have to say yeah thank you and agree with jagriti uh thanks for the question anurad uh vishal do you have a question for us yeah i wanted to ask uh, when did this actually start being so like we went into the alpha stage where actual passengers will be uh, like allowed to use dg yatra Do you have any idea? I think 2018, right, Jagdeep? Um, it was. Do you have any idea? I think 2018, right, Jagdeep? Um, it was launched in 2017. I remember. I remember the press um release was from June 2017, but 2018, if I'm not wrong, Jagdeep, you can correct me. Like, uh, but the, even in 2018, and I, I think even in 2021, there were no digital data lanes with the one where you just show your face and the door opens and so. So it's 2022, 2022 okay. December. Delhi, Varanasi, and one more airport. Three airports. Uh, uh, this this is when it was rolled out. Okay. 
just another follow up question uh, so i was traveling in october 2022 and generally throughout the entirety of 2022 i was traveling a lot and uh, i noticed that by after the security uh, like just before the security check in we were supposed to get a period of wearing masks then, right so while come just before completing the security check in there used to be a military officer and he used to just take our boarding pass and he used to ask us to put our masks masks down he would look into a tv we would look into a screen with us with a camera attached to it and it would just record us it would record us it would record our facial this thing it would uh, record us with a boarding pass and uh, i'm asking if this is in any way connected to jayatra because this was before it was deployed right so in any way it's might have been the training data or some sort of it for the facial for the fit model because this was com- this was not being done after taking any consent at all and they were just uh, asking us to put on our mask and they like there were no jayatra banners or gates at that time it was mostly just uh, showing you putting your boarding pass up holding it beside your face looking into the camera and it, it's showing the live output and you could see yourself just like it was so the recording so, symbol there said which on what airport is this because there was some sort of trials still being run at various airports yeah this was at chennai but uh, this was completely unrelated to digiatra like i i am pretty observant and but there was nothing about digiatra at that time or specific gates or proceeding to like a specialized check in or using fit for checking there was nothing about it at that time in that yeah so it may have been a pilot sort of you know which uh, a few airports were uh, uh, doing on on behalf of the ministry of civil aviation it may have been one of those and because it wasn't still like a proper you know um um roll out um, it is possible that there wasn't enough information displayed etc yeah, but uh, at least they have if they are testing it it has to be some sort of like they have to test the flow and the flow after signing up after getting a face record right so i i have a feeling that actually the training data might also have been like fully accurate as well well i mean uh, this that's the reason why we are here um, you know uh, because uh, this has not been one of the strengths um, of of the government or the digi yatra foundation the collection of privacy uh, sorry the collection of consent has not been one of the strengths and it um, still is problematic um, and uh, i'm sure in during the trial rounds it was even it received even much less attention um is it possible jagriti that uh, some of these um, some of these airports might have their own uh, security you know ways of just ensuring security which might be through um these you know some random cameras like cctvs right cctvs are there in airports so it could just be like a localized thing at the airport level and not really a policy thing no so security at all the major airports is with cisf at many airports is with cisf so security is entirely cisf and now a few checkpoints uh, you have private people uh, deployed but um, you know wherever you are parting with say your document id document etc um, there is always a cisf personnel uh, deployed there yeah, this that was is by a cisf function sorry this was by cisf uh... yeah yeah so i think um, we can like i think look into this a little bit post this call vishal we we'll reach out to you for more information because i i may not i don't know much about this what's happening in chennai airport um very interesting point you raised about training data let's let's um give us a moment to look into it and we got that you for sure yes. um i think we'll move on now to riju riju do you have a question for us no oh, yeah hi happy friday everyone um so one of the chilling things about digi yatra is uh, on the consent screen especially at like newer airports um cisf personnel themselves ask you to say yes on the screen and you have to be like no i want to say no and that's uh, like something very like a uh, dystopian about that because uh, often the people who are not uh, like very high on tech literacy they are the ones who suffer and my question is like uh, less than what 10% of the population has taken a flight in india but now there are talks about frt being uh, enabled in trains and uh, are there any plans to challenge that because uh, if if anything like digi other comes uh, on trains that might be a huge dragnet of data uh, for like the masses traveling so absolutely you are right in noting the uh, frt in trains a bit we've looked at the tender in fact just today i sent a letter to the uh, we sent a letter to the railway ministry saying please don't do this it's a massive violation of privacy also you have to understand um, you know by you i mean policy policy makers need to understand the digital divide that exists in india and if you were to make um, something like digi yatra compulsory to board a train uh, people who board a train a large overwhelming majority of them do not necessarily have very high levels of digital literacy or even data empowerment and their privacy uh, empowerment so that's genuinely a really scary um, move 
when it happens. So we will be definitely on the lookout. We are currently in the look on the lookout on this train FRT tender that's out, and we will be aggressively pushing back against it for sure. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so I want to just add Ditta to that, that while that is being done, um, you know, at railways, uh, the Road Transport Ministry is also going to, what it, what can be called the FRT for cars and vehicles, are going to come out with GNSS-based tolling system. So right now you have fast tags, which will be replaced by global navigation satellites, which will sort of, you know, track your vehicle when it's crossing a particular toll section on a highway um, so that auto debiting of uh, your toll can happen. So, um, so I mean, that's another way the government will be tracking the movement of your vehicles. Got it. Understood. I mean, this is all very, <laughs> this is all very scary. We have been tracking the fast track news as well. Um, but yeah, whenever there is uh, there is news for FRT systems being used in civil surveillance, IFF will definitely be on the case and we will be pushing back against it. We have a very clear idea that FRT um, is up to no good in a country like India or wherever else. It's If it's too accurate, it becomes a surveillance tool um, of like for profiling and targeting. And if it's too inaccurate, it becomes a tool for misidentification, um, you know, catching innocent people and calling them criminals. So either way, there is, an, there is no winning when you use FRT. Um, thanks for flagging that, Jagadi. Now we only have one minute left technically. Uh, so I will ask, um, we'll take two more questions and I'll ask both speakers to keep it extremely brief. Um, a user called Zulu Hotel, if you want to go. Yeah, I, I just want to say uh, two, three points uh, very shortly. I'll try to be as short as possible. First thing is uh, keep talking about it. Uh, we might think that, you know, authorities will not listen to us. Nobody will listen to us, but keep talking about it. We have been keep, uh, talking about Article 370 or something, and today there, were, there was a comment from uh, judgment from Supreme saying you, there is nothing wrong in criticizing the government. So if any policy is issued or any instructions are issued by the government, we don't have to follow that blindly. The next thing is uh, regarding this facial recognition technology. Last year, uh, a man in Telangana died under in police custody. He was subjected to third degree torture. And the reason was, he was a daily wage laborer. He was picked up by the police on the basis of facial recognition technology. Tortured in the custody, died. And now there's nobody, you know, nobody talks about that case today. He lost his life. The man has lost his life. So tomorrow, as a passenger, if I'm, you know, using this DG Yatra, if I'm going somewhere, and somebody, you know, at the last moment, my, my face, 70% uh, of my face comes up, you know, something similar to a person who is in the, in the wanted list. And they stop me from boarding a flight I'm supposed to do that. I'll, 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 lose my, I'll, I'll lose my day and I'll lose everything. So that's the reason, like, uh, there should be some strong law. And, like, if we are uh, comparing the laws in India and laws to the, in the U.S. and all, they have their own set of, you know, privileges. The citizens in U.S., they can sue the authorities. If they raise a voice, they can go on, you know, some platform and raise a voice. The government might listen to them. We don't have any such thing like that. If I if I'm you know arrested by somebody or if I'm wrong being wrongly charged by somebody in some frivolous case, I'll spend my I might spend my entire life you know proving myself that I was not guilty. So yeah. there are perils there are perils in this technology. We need to be one hundred percent sure that you know there there won't be any harm from this. Then only this should be released. Otherwise, what happens is any new technology that is coming into the world, it will be thrusted onto Indians first. Like for example. Pratt and Whitney engines, nobody was taking that engine anywhere in the world because of the long starting time. They, they sold that engine to airlines in India and today airlines in India are suffering the most because of that engine. So I would say this thing, FRT, is something similar to, you know, we don't need to say any uh, yes to the government on everything. We need to be cautious. Um, thank you for that uh, statement, Zulu Hotel. Thanks. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, uh, anyway, anyway, um, in the interest of what... Uh, has been just said, the, we are a democracy, right? There is no benefit in a law that doesn't listen to its people because the law is for its people. Um, and deliberative democracy teaches us um, to speak, to talk about these things and the policy makers win, I mean, hopefully. Um, so yeah, absolutely. With what um, the speaker started with is that keep talking about it. And that's also our ambition. IFF has been talking about Digi Yatra for two or three years now. And we're not planning to stop until they stop. Um, we'll take one last very, very quick question from um, Shivam. And I would please request them to keep it extremely, extremely brief. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, so going forward in the next five years, there is a very high probability that Digi Yatra will be taking over the entire entry process. 
So I don't think there is a way we can avoid this tech stack altogether. Ultimately, I would want my CSF nerd to be doing what they're trained to do and not just check IDs that can be faked by me in a paint soft paint like software within like two minutes. So what's your take from a security point of view? And B, we are constantly saying that uh, the government is collecting a facial recognition data, but the government has already done that multiple times. I renewed my passport, they took a 4K picture of me. I got my Aadhaar card, they took another picture of me. So it's not like the government doesn't already have your data. No, that's true. I can take the second part of it and then Jagriti can come in and comment on the first, which is the security angle. Um, when we say what's the harm, right? Like, I think that this is a question that I'm up on our Instagram or our Twitter everywhere is that our facial data is already out there. Um, there are two, three elements to it. I will start with the most, most basic one, which is consent. Um, is that in when we're taking a picture for a passport, we are very well aware that we are going to be making a passport and we are consenting to our picture being taken for the purposes of a passport, as opposed to technology like, say, a CCTV camera, which is at the absolute end of the spare and we don't even know we are being watched and we, our faces are being scanned. So there is no question of consent, right? So somewhere in the middle of this, a service like Digiatra lies where there is a tiny amount and extent of consent to the fact that we know that we are going to get a face scan for this service. But the consent is not informed and it is not informed because of the design flaw of Digiatra itself. It offers no transparency, does not offer enough information to the passenger about how their data of their face will be used, where it will be shared, where it will be stored, where it will be perched. Um, we can't rely on random tweets made by the Digiatra Foundation officials that say that your data will be perched in 24 hours. Sure. I mean, sure, I will take that. I will believe that also. But then why does your privacy policy make rooms for sharing that data with third parties? And who are these third parties? And why are you... Digi Yatra, which started off as a government policy, why is it now under a private? Where is the transparency? So as long as there is that much opacity and that much um, shouting, shouting, you know, all of this behind some wall that can't be cracked, there will never be informed consent. And that is the absolute benchmark for data processing everywhere around the world. And it is never like it's the one thing that nobody debates on. You need informed consent. So I will say that I think that's a very short answer. We can really go into conversations about, um, you know, a very uh, <laughs> like the way that um, the digi data ecosystem works and data evolve and the many uh, contradicting statements being made about aws hosting for that um, there is a blog post on digi that iff has done and it's very very detailed so i would please encourage you to go through that and encourage all our listeners to read our work on digi Jagdi, very quickly come in on the uh, security angle and then let's wrap up this conversation uh, well, I just uh, we, I guess airports are moving towards rationalizing security deployment. Uh, you know, uh, recruit uh, hiring secure CISF personnel is a very costly affair, and we have seen in the recent past that uh, at several checkpoints. Um, that are not core to security, uh, CISF personnel have been replaced by private uh, staff. And now increasingly, uh, the use of technology is also being adopted. And that is the way that airports of the future will move towards. That's about it. Thank you, Agriti. And uh, I have this moment to thank all of our listeners and, the, and everybody who asked such insightful and empowering questions and made statements. Um, this was a very, very invigorating conversation. Uh, Jagati has, as always, been such a leading voice in Digiatra and providing a passenger-first, human rights-centric experience and uh, research on um, airport and the aviation industry. And that's just very exciting to hear and read from somebody who has no idea about how the industry works. But I will also take this moment uh, to say that at the Internet Freedom Foundation, we have launched a Know Your Rights leaflet that we're very proud about. Um, this PDF is available, and it's a very small about what you can do as a passenger if you are confronted with digi and being coerced into it. This is a leaflet that will tell you what rights that you have and how to fight against it. The leaflet also has a QR code to the right to information reply we got from the Ministry of Civil Aviation stating that digi is not mandatory. And we would love for you guys to use it. Uh, if you're ever, you know, God forbid, in the situation where you've been coerced into using digi try speaking to your CISF personnel, try reasoning with them, show them the RTI response saying that it is not mandatory. Know your rights know and be informed about how your data will be used and then make a call on whether Digi Yatra is worth it or it's not worth it. Thank you for this extremely, extremely cool discussion. And I would encourage once again, everyone to read um, IFF and Jagrati's work on Digi Yatra. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>